recorded live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday night University of Eucadia talk show program. I'm your host, Frank O'Collins, and I thank all those that will be listening to this broadcast live through TalkShoe.com, or those that will be downloading the program later, which will also be available on University of Acadia. Now, the University of Acadia website is university.ucadia.info. That's Acadia, so university.ucadia.info. Well, I look forward to tonight. We've got some fantastic topics Last week, for those that were able to hear the call, would recall that we spent quite a bit of time trying to lay the groundwork and foundation of the challenge of being occupant of the Office of General Executor. And we spent quite a bit of time last week on that because it can appear sometimes quite easy that we use labels, particularly with the Roman system. We hear them using labels all the time administrator, trustee, executor, and so on. But last week, I felt that it was extremely important to make it crystal clear that if we are to look for a standard, a measure of what it means to be a general executor, then we can look really no further uh, and, and to no better candidates than those of history such as Jesus, Yeshua, such as the historical com uh, role of Moses, Buddha, Muhammad, and, and other people that showed a peace, a wisdom, a non-controversy, a teacher, and of course, one who fully understood the law. Well, following on from that tonight, what I would like to, to cover with you is a, no a number of subjects. Uh, there's no particular thing tonight per se, if we were going to choose one, we might choose the role and the relationship of agent principal, something we haven't really investigated to great detail in the past. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about the roles and the presumptions around the agent and agency law, contract law. I'm going to also talk about how this has been updated in the presumptions. I'd like to talk to you about the concept of what is a peaceful inhabitant, and the importance of non-controversy, especially the importance of non-controversy if any of you are now choosing to act properly in the role of being the occupant of the Office of General Executive. And what does that mean? Uh, I would like to also talk to you tonight because this is something that continues to be raised. I want to talk about that's a line accepted for value, an offset. Why does it work in theory? What, what is involved? But even before we get to that, I want to show with you some updates on the notes. And in particular, I want to talk a bit about Roman document procedures and especially the concepts of form. And in their system, the absolute obsession over form versus substance, most important. And then with the time permitting, I want to wrap up with the updates in terms of the Acadia workbenches and the progress of the functions, which are still being rolled out and, and getting ready, and also some of the corrections that have been made to the uh, registration process, which I hope will make it easier for some. And again, I apologise for those that are still maybe having issues in terms of getting registered. So I'll try and cover that in the first hour, first hour and 10 minutes of the call. And then as we have been doing on a regular basis, I then invite all of you who are listening live to let me know your questions. And for that, I ask at the end of the hour, wait if you can, please, until the end of the hour, that you can type in in capitals question into the chat box on TalkShoe, your question, and I'd be more than happy to answer any question you have. And if you'd like to talk, and I'd be more than welcome to hear from you, and I'm sure people would love to hear your question live, then please, at the end of the first hour, hour and 10 minutes, type in star eight or hash eight, and then I will see you queued on that, and then in order, we'll take the calls. As always, remember this is information and updates in terms of research. 
Uh, none of it is supposed to be direct legal advice. And with everything with you, Katie, we ask you to approach it with competence, with common sense, and always question the relevance for it yourself. And if you're not sure, sure always seek the advice of others. Uh, and please, I hope that you find this information useful. Well, let's start then. I'd like to cover the area of agent and agency. And this was brought up uh, following the, the conversation of last week. And it related to an example in court, and we might actually get a couple of people to actually come on the call at the end of the, the hour who actually give their first-hand experience. But it, it came from an example in court where in a particular case, uh, an individual who was um, incarcerated, had been brought in, was in the yellow jump, uh, sorry, orange jumpsuit, was in chains, came into court and struck upon this concept of speaking and pointing to the judge, pointing to the prosecutor and pointing to the clerk that they did not recognize them. In fact, they literally spoke, I do not recognize you. But some of you may recall in some earlier talk shoes, we attempted to incorporate this knowledge, although we didn't have a complete picture at the time, into the form of a prayer and suggested it as uh, one idea that one might consider. Well, tonight, I want to explain what we now comprehend as far as the reason that in this case, when this man spoke these words, the judge, the prosecutor, and the clerk in quick succession exited the courtroom as if there was some fire. And later it turns out that the particular individual was offered a honourable exit and the case was largely dropped. So what's going on there and what is an agent? And for this, I'm going to ask you, if you could please, to go to the site one-heaven.org and when you get into the site one-heaven.org, I ask you, if you could please, uh, to uh, click on any of the links to the reform law sites. Uh, Globe Union Court, for example, is a perfectly fine site to go to. If you want to go to this site directly, just type in Globe dash or globe hyphen union dash or hyphen court dot org globe hyphen union hyphen court dot org and uh, when you get there i'm going to ask you if you could please click on roman court procedures and when you get to roman court procedures you, you should if you refresh the page you should see that there is a new link uh, called agent and uh I hope someone can put that link in. On that link, uh, we have some background on the meaning of an agent. And let me go through this with you because like several key areas of uh, Roman law, of the laws of the private bar guild, it is steeped in disinformation. So let's start by the definition of what we mean by an agent because it is, of course, a crucial, crucial role in their system. So I'm reading from this page, agent under Roman court procedures, under any of the court sites, UK court sites. Okay, an agent, also known as an administrator, there's the word administrator, is one who is entrusted a right or an agency by another, the principal, to act for them, and in particular, one who is entrusted to transact all business of a principal. And when you go and look at the history of the role of an agent, and I'm sure a number of you are familiar with the word agent because in uh, accepted for value, in credit and commerce, in uh, most of the truth movement, the saying uh, notice to principal is notice to agent and notice to agent is notice to principal is seen as one of the fundamental common law rights that you possess. Well, let's go into the detail here and see what we have discovered to the true nature of an agent. The word itself, 
we move on here. The word itself is derived from the Latin agentus, meaning effective. And while the word is claimed to, be, uh, to have been created in the 16th century, there is no credible uh, definition that states the word appeared less than the 16th century and hence under the reforms of Henry VIII. In reality, the first time the word appears in statute, in law, is as late as 1730. And it, its first use is in the Act, the Landlord and Tenant Act in 1730. Now, there is no attempt to link the word agent to the concept of agency, and there is certainly no attempt in the use of the word in the Landlord and Tenant Act in 1730 to link it to the concept of contract or any implied contract or how an agent may be appointed. Now, the term is then used sparingly, and we find it used again in an act called the Distress the Rent Act of 1737 of the United Kingdom, and then in the Constable's Protection Act of 1750. Now, this is extremely, extremely important because one of the claims that is made on agent is that it has an intimate link to a common law principle from a Latin maxim, key facet, per alium facet per se, meaning one who acts through another acts in his or her own interests. Now, whilst we all, and I, and I myself, have a romantic affection to the idea of common law rights, sadly, some of these claimed rights never really existed. And it appears, when we speak of the word of agent, by the hard evidence, the concept itself did not appear to well into the 18th century. And so the provenance of the idea that the role of agent principle itself appears to be something much, much later in creation. So when did it come in? When did it start? When did the concept of agency and contract start to appear? Well, it really didn't start to appear until after 1816, after the time that the Rothschilds had bankrupted the British Empire and started to convert the crown entities into corporations where enclosure and the corporate model of the world that we now live in started to be embedded down in full swing. And in fact, the con connection between the role of an agent, the appointment of an agent, their rights being the capacity of an agency, and the definition associated with this in terms of how it may be formed is not formally defined in any statute until, wait for it, 1872 in the Indian Contract Act. Now, I want to just have a quick moment on the Indian Contract Act because when you hear that, as I first heard it, my instant reaction, and I, I took it on face value, was to believe that this was an extraordinarily detailed act of historic proportions that is the first time in British parliamentary history that they clearly express the role of agent, principal, contract and commercial law, but not for those in England, but apparently for one of their colonies to the exclusion of others. An extraordinary anomaly, one of the most anomalous statutes in history anywhere in the world. Why go to the extent of creating an extraordinarily detailed, sophisticated, defined act and exclude other parts of the Commonwealth? in the term Indian Contract Act 1872. Well, the answer rests in what 